فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم section regarding shortening the prostration or recitation the author رحمه الله talks about في اختصار السجود shortening the prostration وهو أن يقرأ آية أو آيتين ثم يسجد حكى ابن المنذر على الشعبي نعم This is when the reciter reads a verse or two and then prostrates. Ibn Mundir, Ibn Mundir mentioned that al Sha'bi, al Hassan al Basri, Muhammad ibn Sirin, al Nahari, Imam Ahmed, and Ishaq dislike this practice. However, Imam Abu Hanifa, Muhammad ibn Hassan, and Abu Thaw have said that there is nothing wrong with this and their view is in accordance with our school of thought on this matter. Naam. So here he talks about the summarization of اختصار uh, السجود, shortening the sujood, which is that أن يقرأ آية أو آيتين The person reads a verse or two and then he prostrates. Ibn al-Mundir, he narrated this from Sha'bi and Hassan al-Basri and Muhammad ibn Sirin and Nakha'i, Ibrahim al Nakha'i, and Ahmed and Ishaq, that they disliked this idea. They didn't like it. Abu Hanifa and Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, Abi Thawr, they said there's no harm with this and this is in accordance to the Madhab al-Shafi'iyya. Naam. Section. When a reciter prays by himself, he should prostrate in accordance with his recitation. So if a person um, So if a person prostrates, إذا كان مصليا منفردا, he's by himself, he's praying alone. سجد لقراءة And he prostrates because of a recitation, his own recitation. Naam. Should the reciter leave out the prostration or recitation and then bow, it becomes impermissible for him to make the prostration or recitation. No, it's not permissible for them. No, if he, if he then makes the prostration or recitation whilst knowing that he should not, his prayer becomes invalidated. So, if, however, the reciter begins to bow but does not reach the bowing position and wishes to make the prostration or recitation, he may do so and his prayer will not be invalidated. Likewise, if the reciter begins to make the prostration or recitation and then decides not to and goes back to his standing position, this is acceptable. <laughs> so if, the, for example, فَلَوْ تَرَكَ السُّجُودَ التِّلَاوَةِ He leaves off the prostration and then he does ruku' and then he intends to do the sujood. It's not permissible for him to do that. You can't leave the ruku' and then go to the sujood tilawa now because you've moved on from the standing and you've moved on to the ruku' no longer allowed for you. If the person does that with knowledge, then his salah becomes null and void. What about if the person, he goes towards ruku' but he didn't reach the level of ruku' he's not fully in a state of ruku' then, in this, then he can change it into a sujood. He, he was going to go ruku' then he realized he can just fully go if he wants to now. It is not permissible for one praying alone to prostrate to someone else's recitation whether that person is in prayer or outside of it. If he does prostrate whilst knowing that he shouldn't, his prayer becomes invalidated. So if a person is praying by himself, okay, if he's praying by himself and he is a reciter reciting, whether that reciter is in prayer or he's outside prayer, it is not permissible for him to prostrate according to it. Because this has got nothing to do with you. You're praying by yourself. So if another person is praying next to you and you somehow hear them read loudly an ayat al ruku' you can't do ruku' with them. So you can't do sujood with them. You can't do sujood with them. Or if the person is sitting somewhere and he's reading the Quran and he comes to ayah sujood, you can't say, oh, because he's reading ayah sujood, I'm going to follow him and I'm going to do it. It is not permissible for you and if you do, your salah becomes null and void. Naam. The rulings about apply to the Imam praying in congregation just as they apply to one praying alone. Mm -hmm. Additionally, if the Imam prostrates through his own recitation, it becomes obligatory upon one being led in prayer to prostrate. Mm -hmm. If he does not, his prayer becomes invalidated. No. Likewise, if the Imam does not prostrate, those being led in prayer should also not prostrate. And if they do, their prayer becomes invalidated. So. It is however recommended to prostrate after the prayer, but this is not something that is firmly recommended. <laughs> No. If the Imam makes the prostration or recitation and then rises from it without the individual being led in prayer being aware of this, he will be excused for not prostrating with the Imam and it is not permissible for him to prostrate. 
If, however, one being led in prayer realizes that the Imam is prostrating before the Imam rises, he must prostrate along with him. But if the Imam rises as he is prostrating, he should stop and rise with the Imam. Mm -hmm. If the individual being led in prayer is too weak or too old to keep up with the Imam, the same ruling applies. It is impermissible for those being led in prayer to prostrate to any recitation other than that of their Imam. Doing so results in the prayer becoming invalidated. It's also disliked for one being led in prayer to recite verses that contain prostrations or to listen to any recitation other than that of his Imam. Section. Faslun fi waqti sujood littilawa. قال العلماء ينبغي أن يقع عقيب آية السجدة التي قرأها أو سمعها فإن أخر ولم ولم يطل الفصل سجد وإن طال فقد فات السجود فلا يقضي على المذهب الصحيح المشهور كما لا يقضي صلاة الكسوف وقال بعض أصحابنا فيه قول ضعيف إنه يقضي كما يقضي السنن الراتبة كسنة الصبح والظهر وغيرهما وأما إذا كان القارئ أو المستمع محدثا عند تلاوة السجدة فإن تطهر على القرب سجد وإن تأخرت طهارته حتى طال الفصل فالصحيح المختار الذي قطع به الكثيرون أنه لا يسجد وقيل يسجد وهو اختيار البغوي من أصحابنا كما يجيب المؤذن بعد الفراغ من الصلاة والاعتبار, والاعتبار في طول الفصل في هذا العرف على المختار والله تعالى أعلم so now when is it that the person should prostrate to the recitation of the Quran which they read? Uh, yeah? The scholars have stated that the prostration of recitation should be made immediately after reciting or hearing the relevant verse. So the person should not prostrate hours later or minutes later when the recitation of the verse is being done and the verse is being read. The person immediately, immediately after hearing the recitation or even after read the recitation, straight away they should go and prostrate. Naam. And that it is acceptable to delay it a little. As for delaying it a little bit, then this is also permissible. A little bit. Not that a person hours later prostrates. Naam. If, however, the delay becomes more prolonged or if, the, or if the prostration is missed altogether, one does not make up the prostration just as one does not make up a missed eclipse prayer. And this is the correct and popular view within our school of thought. This is like Kusuf. If you miss the kusuf, you can't say, oh no, I missed it, so I'm going to pray now. Nah, you can't. The same is with the sujood al tilawa. If you, if you lengthen it too long, you're not allowed to bring it back. You've passed it, now keep it moving. Some of our companions have mentioned a weak opinion regarding this matter, stating that the prostration can be made up, just as the primary non-obligatory prayers can be made up. Some scholars, they say, no, why are you guys comparing it to Salat al-Kusuf? Why don't you compare it to the Sunan al-Rawatib? Like Sunnah to Subhi. A person misses the Sunnah to Subh. Can they bring it back after the Subh? Yes, they can. So then they said, this is like it. You can bring it back. But he, look what he said. He says, Fihi qawlun da'if. This opinion is weak. According to Nawawi, it's a weak opinion. Naam. If the reciter or the listener reaches a verse of prostration while in a state of ritual impurity and hurries to make ablution, he may prostrate. If, however, he delays ablution, then according to the most widely held view, he should not prostrate. Now, as for if the reciter or the listener is in a state of impurity when the recitation of the verse is being done, if he then goes quickly and he does the hara, he comes back, then no problem, he can do sujood. <coughs> but if he's somebody who takes time doing sujood, he takes time folding up and he's slowly and he does it, and he likes to take off his shoes and he likes to take off everything and get ready and run the water and check if the water is... and he takes that long, they say there's nothing for him to come back to. There's nothing for him to come back to. وَإِنْ تَأَخَّرَتْ طَهَارَتُهُ حَتَّى طَالَ الْفَصْلُ فَالصَّحِيحُ الْمُخْتَارِ الَّذِي قَطَعَ بِهِ الْأَكْتَرُونَ أَنَّهُ لَا يَسْجُدُ That he doesn't prostrate. وَقِيلَ يَسْجُدُ Some said he prostrates. Remember the scholars when they say قِيلَ is that they're weakening that opinion. They're making it as a weak opinion, eh? Others, including al Bagawi, hold the opinion that prostration is to be made even after a delay, just as one repeats the quarter prayer made by the Mu'addin after finishing prayer. 
And Imam al rahimahullah actually says that it shouldn't be more, longer than two rak'ah. Two rak'ah, your absence shouldn't be longer than that. So he restricts it to that amount. Rahimahullah. And he's a shafi'i. The period of time considered a delay is defined by custom according to the chosen view and Allah knows best. So now we then again kind of indirectly refuse Baghawi, saying that two rak'ah or this rak'ah, all of that is not right. How long? What determines if, it's, if you've been out for long and if you were not? It's all determined by the urf, the custom of the people. And Allah knows best. Fasrun. Fi hukmi tikrari ayati sajda. Ida qara as sajdata sajdadat sajdata sajd. Ida qara as sajdat. Ida qara as sajdadat. I can't read the dal and the ta together. How do you say it? Sajdadat. 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 Ida kara as sajdat 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 Ida kara as sajdati I can't, I'll never do it. Kulluha au sajdati Minha fi majlisin wahidin sajda li kulli sajdatin bila khilafin wa in karrara al ayat al wahidati fi majalis sajda li kulli marratin bila khilafin fa in karrara fi al majlis al wahid نظر فإن لم يسجد للمرة الأولى كفاه سجدة واحدة عن الجميع وإن سجد للأولى ففيه ثلاثة أوجه أصح أن يسجد لكل مرة سجدة لتجدد السبب بعد توفية بعد توفية حكم الأول والثاني تكفيه والثاني تكفيه السجدة الأولى عن الجميع وهو قول ابن سريج وهو مذهب أبي حنيفة رحمه الله قال صاحب العدة من أصحابنا وعليه الفتوى واختار الشيخ النصر المقدسي الزاهد من أصحابنا والثالث إن طال الفصل سجد وإلا فتكفيه الأولى أما إذا كرر سجدة سجدة الواحدة في الصلاة فإن كان في ركعة فهي كالمجلس الواحد فيكون فيه الأوجه الثلاثة وإن كان في ركعتين فك فكالمجلسين فيعيد السجود بلا خلاف فصل في حكم السجود التلاوة للراكب على الدابة إذا قرأ إذا قرأ السجدة وهو راكب على دابة في السفرة دابة في السفرة إذا قرأ السجدة وهو راكب على دع على دابة في السفرة سجد الإماء هذا مذهبنا ومذهب مالك وأبي حنيفة وأبو يوسف وأبي يوسف ومحمد وأحمد وزفر وداود وغيرهم وقال بعض أصحاب أبي حنيفة لا يسجد والصواب مذهب الجماهير وأما الراكب في الحضر فلا يجوز أن يسجد بالإماء فصل في حكم قراءة آية آية السجدة في غير محلها من الصلاة إذا قرأ آية السجدة في الصلاة قبل الفاتحة سجد بخلاف ما لو قرأها في الركوع والسجود فإنه لا يجوز له أن يسجد لأن القيام محل القراءة ولو قرأ السجدة فهو ليسجد فشك هل قرأ الفاتحة فإنه يسجد للتلاوة ثم يعيد إلى القيام فيقرأ الفاتحة لأن سجود التلاوة لا يؤخر فصل في حكم قراءة آية السجدة بالفارسية لو قرأ آية السجدة بالفارسية لا يسجد عندنا كما لو فسر آية كما لو فسر آية سجدة وقال أبو حنيفة يسجد فصل في عدم ارتباط سجود المستمع بسجود القارئ إذا سجد المستمع مع القارئ لا يرتبط به ولا ينوي الاقتداء به ولا ينوي الاقتداء به وله الرفع وله الرفع من السجود قبله فصل في حكم قراءة آية السجدة للإمام لا تكره قراءة آية السجدة للإمام عندنا سواء كانت الصلاة سرية أو جهرية ويسجد, مع ويسجد متى قرأها وقال مالك يكره ذلك مطلقا وقال أبو حنيفة وأحمد تكره في السرية وقال أبو حنيفة وأحمد تكره في السرية دون الجهرية فصل في حكم سجود التلاوة في الأوقات المنهي عنها 
لا يكرع عندنا سجود التلاوة في الأوقات التي نهي عن الصلاة فيها وبه قال الشعبي والحسن البصري والحسن البصري وسالم بن عبد الله والقاسم وعطاء وعكرمة وأبو حنيفة وأصحاب الرأي ومالك في إحدى الروايتين وكري ذلك طائفة من العلماء منهم عبد الرحمن بن عمر وسعيد بن المسيب ومالك في الرواية الأخرى وإسحاق بن راهوية وأبو ثور فصل في حكم قيام الركوع مقام سجود تلاوة لا يقوم الركوع مقام سجود تلاوة في حال الاختيار هذا مذهبنا ومذهب جماهير العلماء من السلف والخلف وقال أبو حنيفة رحمه الله يقوم مقامه ودليل الجمهور القياس على سجود السر القياس القياس على سجود الصلاة وأما العاجز عن السجود فيومئ إليه كما يومئ بسجود الصلاة فصل في في صفة السجود اعلم أن الساجد للتلاوة له حالان أحدهما أن يكون خارج الصلاة والثاني أن يكون فيها أما الأول فإذا أراد السجود نوى سجود التلاوة وكبر للإحرام ورفع يديه حذ ومنكبيه حذ ومنكبي بوث ويز كما يفعل في تكبيرة الإحرام للصلاة ثم يكبر تكبيرة أخرى للهوي للهوي إلى السجود ولا يرفع فيها اليد وهذه تكبيرة الثانية في وهذه التكبيرة الثانية مستحبة ليست بشرط كتكبيرة سجدة, سجدة الصلاة وعمنا تكبيرة الأولى تكبيرة الإحرام ففيها ثلاثة أوجه لأصحابنا أظهرها وهو قول الأكثرين منهم أنها ركن لا يصح السجود إلا بها والثانية أنها مستحبة ولو تركت صح السجود وهذا قول, الس... وهذا قول الشيخ أبي محمد الجويني تصفاد ربما على الجويني والثالث ليست مستحبة والله تعالى أعلم ثم إن كان الذي يريد السجود قائما كبر للإحرام في حال قيامه ثم كبر للسجود في انحطاطه إلى السجود وإن كان جالسا فقد قال جماعات من أصحابنا يستحب له أن يقوم فيكبر للإحرام قائما ثم يهوي إلى السجود كما, ك- كما إذا كان في الابتداء قائما والدليل هذا القياس على الإحرام والسجود في الصلاة وممن نص على هذا وجزم به من أصحابنا من أئمة أصحابنا الشيخ أبو محمد الجويني والقاضي حسين والقاضي حسين وصح 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 وصاحباه صاحبا التتمة والتهذيب والإمام المحقق أبو القاسم الرافعي وحكاه الإمام الحرمين عن والده الشيخ أبي محمد ثم أنكره وقال لم أرى لهذا أصلا ولا ذكرى وهذا الذي قاله إمام الحرمين ظاهر فلم يثبت في شيء عرم عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا عمن يقتدى به من السلف ولا تعرض له الجمهور من أصحابنا والله تعالى أعلم ثم إذا سجد فينبغي أن يراعي آداب السجود في الهيئات والتسبيح أما الهيئات فينبغي أن يضع يديه حذ ومنكبي حذ ومنكبي حذ ومنكبي على الأرض ويضم أصابعه وينشرها إلى جهة القبلة ويخرجها من كمه ويباشر بها المصلى ويجافي مرفقيه عن جنبيه ويرفع بطنه عن فخذه إن كان رجلا فإن كانت امرأة أو خنثى لم تجافي ويرفع الساجد أسافله ويرفع الساجد أسافله على رأسه ويمكن جبهته وأنفه من المصلى ويطمئن في سجود وأما التسبيح في السجود فقال أصحابنا يسبح بما يسبح في سجود الصلاة فيقول ثلاث مرات سبحان ربي الأعلى ثم يقول اللهم لك سجدت وبك آمنت ولك أسلمت سجد وجهي للذي خلقه وصوره وشق سبعه وبصره بحق وقوتي تبارك الله أحسن الخالقين ويقول سبوح قدوس رب رب الملائكة والروح فهذا كله مما يقول في السجود الصلاة قالوا ويستحب أن يقول اللهم اكتب لي بها عندك جرا واجعلها لي عندك ذخرا وضع عني بها وزرا وأقبلها مني كما قبلتها من عبدك داود صلى الله عليه وسلم وهذا الدعاء خصيص بهذه السجدة فينبغي أن يحافظ عليه وذكر الأستاذ إسماعيل الضرير في كتابه التفسير أن اختيار الشافعي رحمه الله في دعاء 
دُعَاءِ السُّجُودِ تِلَاوَةً أَنْ يَقُولَ سُبْحَانَ رَبَّنَا إِنْ كَانَ وَعْدُ رَبِّنَا لَمَفْعُولًا وهذا النقل عن الشافعي غريب جدا وهو حسن فإن ظاهر القرآن يقتضي مضح من قال في السجود فيستحب أن يجمع بين هذه الأذكار كلها ويدعو معها بما يريد من أمور الآخرة والدنيا وإن اقتصر على بعضها حصل أصل التصبيح ولو, ولو, ولو لم يسبح بشيء أصلا ولو لم يسبح بشيء أصلا حصل السجود حصل السجود كسجود الصلاة ثم إذا فرغ من التسبيح والدعاء رفع رأسه مكبرا وهل يفتقر إلى السلام وهل يفتقر إلى السلام في قولان منصوصان للشافعية فيه قولان منصوصان للشافعي مشهوران أصحهما عند جماهير أصحابه أنه يفتقر لافتقاره إلى الإحرام ويصير كصلاة الجنازة ويؤكد هذا ويؤيد هذا ما رواه ابن أبي داود بإسناده الصحيح عن عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله عنه أنه كان إذا قرأ السجدة سجد ثم سلم والثاني لا يفتقر كسجود التلاوة في الصلاة ولأنه لم ينقل ولأنه لم ينقل عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ذلك فعل الأول أن يفتقر إلى التشهد في وجهان أصحهما أصحهما لا يفتقر كما لا يفتقر إلى القيام وبعض أصحابنا يجمع بين المسألتين ويقول ويقول في التشهد والسلام ثلاثة أوجه أصحها أنه لا بد من السلام دون التشهد والثاني لا يحتاج إلى واحد منهما والثالث لا بد منهما ومن من قال من السلف يسلم محمد بن سيرين وأبو عبد الرحمن وأبو عبد الرحمن السلمي وأبو الأحوص وأبو قلابة وإسحاق بن راهوي ومن من قال لا يسلم الحسن البصري حسن البصري وسعيد بن جبير وإبراهيم النخعي ويحيى بن وثاب وأحمد وهذا كله في الحال الأول وهو السجود خارج الصلاة والحال الثاني أن يسجد للتلاوة في الصلاة فلا يكبر للإحرام ويستحب أن يكبر للسجود ولا يرفع يديه ويكبر للرفع من السجود هذا هو الصحيح المشهور الذي عليه هذا هو الصحيح المشهور الذي قاله الجمهور وقال أبو علي بن أبي هريرة من أصحابنا لا يكبر للسجود ولا للرفع والمعروف الأول وأما الأدب في, هي في هيئة السجود والتسريع فعلى ما تقدم في السجود خارج الصلاة إلا أنه إذا كان الساجد إماما فينبغي أن لا يطول التسبيح إلا أن يعلم من حال المأمومين أنهم يؤثرون التطويل ثم إذا رفع من السجود قام ولا يجلس للاستراحة بلا خلاف وهذه مسألة غريبة قل من نص عليها ومن من نص عليها القاضي حسين والبغوي والرافعي وهذا بخلاف سجود الصلاة فإن القول الصحيح المنصوص للشافعي المختار الذي جاءت به الحديث الصحيحة في البخاري وغيره استحباب جلسة الاستراحة عقب الصج عقب السجدة الثانية من الركعة الأولى من كل الصلوات ومن الثالثة في الرباعيات ثم إذا رفع رأسه من سجدة التلاوة فلا بد من الانتصاب قائما والمستحب إذا انتصب قائما أن يقرأ شيئا ثم يركع فإن انتصب ثم ركع من غير قراءة جاز فصل في الأوقات المختار للقراءة اعلم أن أفضل اعلم أن أفضل القراءة ما كان في الصلاة ومذاب الشافعي وغيره أن تطويل القيام في الصلاة أفضل من تطويل السجود وأما القراءة في غير الصلاة فأفضلها قراءة الليل والنصف الأخير من الليل أفضل من الأول والقراءة بين المغرب والعشاء محبوبة وأما القراءة في النار أفضلها بعد الصلاة الصبح ولا كراءة في القراءة في وقت من الأوقات لمعنى فيه وأما ما رواه ابن أبي داود عن معان عن معان بن رفاعة عن مشايخه أنهم كرهوا القراءة بعد العصر وقالوا هو دراسة يهود فغير مقبول ولا أصل له ويختار من الأيام يوم الجمعة يوم الجمعة والاثنين والخميس ويوم عرفة ومن, الأشع ومن الأعشار العشر الأخير من رمضان والعشر الأول من ذي الحجة ومن الشهور رمضان فصل في القارئ ماذا يفعل إذا 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 ارتج إذا أرت إذا ارتج عليه إذا إذا أرت إذا أرتج عليه 
إذا أرتج إذا أرتج على القاري فلم يدري ما بعد الموضع الذي انتهى إليه فسال عنه غيره فينبغي أن يتأدب بما جاء عن عبد الله بن مسعود وإبراهيم النخعي وبشير بن أبي مسعود رضي الله عنهم أنهم قالوا إذا سأل أحدكم أخاه عن آية فليقرأ ما قبلها ثم يسكت ولا يقول كيف كذا وكذا فإنه يلبس عليه recites all or some of the verses of prostration in one sitting, he should prostrate at each of them, and if he repeats one verse at different sittings, he should prostrate each time he recites it. Now, so if a person recites all of the sajdat in one sit, he does sujood for each of those sajda without any khilaf. Now. If the reciter repeats the same verse of prostration in one sitting and does not prostrate the first time he recites, then one prostration is sufficient for all. Mm -hmm. If he does prostrate, so he reads one ayah of sajda and repeats it many times. He cannot do it once. That's enough for him. He doesn't have to every time he comes across that the same verse. He doesn't have to do sajda for it all the time. Now, if he does prostrate the first time he recites it, then there are three opinions with regards to what he should do the rest of the times he recites it. So there are three opinions. First one is... The best of these opinions is that he should prostrate each time he recites it due to renewed reason for doing so after having made the first prostration. This is the strongest opinion according to Nawi, hey? Yeah? The second opinion is that the first prostration suffices for the rest and this is the opinion held by Ibn Suraj and Abu Hanifa Rahimullah. Among our companions, the author of al rudda reported that a religious verdict was issued asserting this opinion this is also the chosen opinion of Sheikh Nasr al-Maqdisi al zahid mm -hmm. who is also among our companions. Sh Nasr, not Nasr. Sheikh Nasr al-Maqdisi al zahid who is also among our companions. Mm -hmm. The third opinion states that if there is a long interval between recitations of the same verse, then the reciter should prostrate. Otherwise, he should not prostrate and the first prostration is sufficient. So the third opinion is actually a more of a middle path from the two opinions. The first opinion says always, always prostrate. The second one is the first suffices you. The third, on the other hand, is what? It depends on how the duration between each one. If it's close to each other, then the first one suffices you. But if you say it, and then you go and do something, and you come back again, then you should prostrate. Repeating the same verse in one rak'ah during prayer takes the same ruling as repeating it in the same sitting, and so the three opinions just mentioned apply. Repeating the same verse in two different laqa'as is similar to repeating it in two different sittings and the recitator should therefore prostrate for each recitation. This is something the scholars have agreed upon unanimously. No. Section. If one recites the verse of prostration while riding an animal and on a journey, he only need gesture by leaning forward. This so if a person is on a riding beast and uh, he's traveling or something, he's on a riding beast, his prostration doesn't have to be that he goes on the ground and he prostrates. He just has to do this gesture. He just moves his head forward like he's doing prostration. That's it. That's enough. That's called ima. That's a gesture. Uh, yeah? This is the ruling according to our school of thought and that of Malik, Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf, Muhammad, Ahmed, Zufar, Dawood, and others. Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, that's Muhammad. Uh, yeah? Some of Abu Hanifa's companions have stated that one should not prostrate in this instance, but the first opinion is the correct view on this issue, and it is the opinion held by the majority of scholars. A rider who is not travelling is not permitted to prostrate by gesture. Mm -hmm. Section. If one recites a verse of prostration during prayers, but before reciting al fatiha he should prostrate. If, however, he, he reads a verse of prostration while bowing or prostrating, it is not permissible for him to prostrate because the standing position is the only position where it is permissible to recite. So. If upon reciting a verse of prostration, the reciter begins to prostrate and then has doubts as to whether or not he has recited Al-Fatiha, he should continue with his prostration and then stand up to recite Al-Fatiha as the prostration of recitation may not be delayed. So here, the Shaykh Rahimahullah, he talks about if a person recites Ayah of Sajda in the Salah before Fatiha, he prostrates for whatever reason. But there's a difference. If he read it in Ruku' or Sujood, what does he do? Then he doesn't do Sujood here. Because the Qiyam, are you with me? Is the position where you actually should recite. But in the Ruku' and in the Sujood, you're not meant to be reading Quran. Now. Section. If 
one recites a verse of prostration in Persian. So now he's talking about reciting ayah, ayah to sajda in Persian. What's the ruling pertaining to that? Now. If one recites a verse of prostration in Persian, he should not prostrate according to our view, just as he would not prostrate if interpreting such a verse. So if a person is now doing interpretation of a verse and explaining a verse in English, for example, or if he's explaining it in Persian, he shouldn't prostrate now. Imam Abu Hanifa, however, is of the opinion that the reciter should prostrate. Some scholars say the reason is because he's Persian. Some scholars they say because he's Persian. Section. Because a listener who prostrates with the reciter is not deemed to be tied to the reciter's actions and because his intention is not to follow the reciter, it is permissible for him to raise his head before the reciter. Now. So, no, I'm from the head. Section. According to our school, it is not disliked for the Imam to recite a verse of prostration during prayers, whether the recitation is allowed or silent. This lies contrary to the view of Malik, who saw that it was disliked in either kind of prayer, and Abu Hanifa, who saw that it was disliked during silent prayers. So, here the issue of reciting the ayah to sajda, the Imam reading it, whilst in a prayer where he's not reading it out, like Dhuhr or Asr or those prayers. You see, is it disliked? لا تكره قراءة آية السجدة للإمام عندنا. According to the Shafi'i Madhab, it's not disliked. Whether that prayer is Sirriya or Jahriya. And whenever he does, Shafi'i believe he can do sujood. As if Imam Malik, rahimahullah, disliked unrestrictedly. Abu Hanifa and Imam Ahmad are of the opinion it is disliked in the Sirri, but it's not disliked in the Jahri. Like in the Malikiya, they, they, it's unrestricted. Whether it's Sirri or Jahri is the same for them. Are you there? Is disliked. As for the Hanafis, the Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, sorry, and Imam Ahmed, they dislike it in the Salat which is Sirri. So Dhuhr al Asr to read ayah of Sajda is disliked. But it's no problem with when it comes to the Jahri recitation. Now, section. Also, in accordance with our school of thought, it is not disliked to make the prostration or recitation at the times when prayer is prohibited. There are times that the Prophet prohibited a person to pray. Are you there? There's a time when prayer is prohibited from you, right? Are you, are you with me, brothers? It's called Salah, it's called Allah Qawd, Allah Awqat al Manhi, as Salat al Manhi Anha. Awqat, when the Salah is Manhi, the Salah is prohibited from you. You're not, allowed, you're not allowed to pray. Like when the sun's rising, the Prophet said, don't pray at that time because, because of what? Because the, shay, the slay, shaitan worshippers are worshipping shaitan. And this is a powerful hadith because. It shows you an imitation of the kuffar. So even if you intend to do good, uh, but what you're doing is, is righteousness. And you're praying, look, salah. But they're worshiping shaitan. You're not allowed to look like them. So don't do it. Forget the salah for that reason. Imagine the person wants to dress like the kuffar. He wants to act like the kuffar. Scary, right? You're not even allowed to do the salah at that time just so you don't look like them. The salah. Ala kulli hal, that time the prayer is prohibited. Alisa kadalik? Huh? It is. It's prohibited. Now that it's prohibited, and Imam al is saying, but the sujood tilawa is permissible. Are you there? The sujood tilawa is what? It is prohibited. So it's permissible, sorry. It's permissible. You're allowed to do sujood tilawa. And this opinion is held by who? This is the opinion of a Sha'bi Hassan al Basri, Salim ibn Abdullah, Qasim al and Iqrima Abu Hanifa, the people of opinion in Malik, in one of the reports attributed to him. So Salim ibn Abdullah, he is from the, uh, he's the children of who? Uh, 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 Abdul. Uh, Salim is uh, Abdullah ibn Umar's son. There is some, does anyone know the names of the Fuqaha Sabah, the seven jurists in Medina? You see how it's, it's needed now. There's a line of poetry you can just memorize it with. But you'd have to find it yourself, inshallah. Do you remember how, what it starts with? Being gulid every day in the car, we would listen to it just so, you know, just so these things stick. Just listen to it every day. Just, when you come into the car, make it, a, a, just put it in, just listen to it. I haven't been with you for a while, eh? Hey, anyone remember it? 
إذا قيل من في العلم سبعة أبحر روايته روايتهم ليست على العلم خارجة فقلهم عبيد الله عروة قاسم سعيد أبي بكر عروة خارجة هذا الفقهاء السبعة السبع جوز نافذ نافذ Other scholars disliked this practice, and among them are Abu Ra ibn Umar, Sa'id ibn Musayyib, Malik, Ishaq ibn Rahawi, and Abu Thawb. We'll stop there, inshallah ta'ala, and tomorrow we could finish, bi al kareem It looks, we've only got, um, because we have to stop at um, uh, page 20, 220. 220 we finished, because the 10th the, the chapter is just the terms and the words which we already ta tackled. So we have, how much pages? Yeah, so inshallah ta'ala, tomorrow we might carry on up to 10 o'clock. Sorry, 1 o'clock. Inshallah ta'ala. Uh, I'll conclude there, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayhi.